Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is David Yambor. Uh, I'm Head of Systems Engineering at Vodafone UK. Um, and uh, uh, Systems Engineering, uh, if you wonder, is basically uh, responsible for uh, moving the code from one place to another, uh, responsible for the infrastructure, for the automation and everything, uh, which is SRE, which is the topic today. Cool. Uh, so I'm Darren Ellicott. Um, I'm our lead account manager at HackerJob. Um, and the account manager for Vodafone, who I've been working with at this point for two glorious years. Uh, it's been been quite a journey seeing um, that Newbury office build out, and I do love going there every time I get the opportunity to go there. So I'm really excited about this this conversation. I really hope to get back to the Newbury office soon. Uh, it is a long time since we managed to get there. It's uh, it's such a beautiful office. If you look at the uh, if you look at the, like the river that goes through the the office and everything like that and as you enter you've got the like vodafone store in there on the right hand side um i was a black sheep last time i went there i was with ee thankfully at this point i've switched back to vodafone um and i'm loving everything you guys have got on the my vodafone app and all that kind of stuff um i'm looking forward to being able to take advantage of some of the offers that you have on my vodafone app once uh Went to back to new normality. I was taking advantage of the uh, of the coffees on offer, but <laughs> can't really get many coffees at the moment, unfortunately. No, uh, the last one which I remember, which was a really big one, is free champagne for many of the customers. I remember when it was kicked oh, off for an hour. Nice, an amazing amount of people played that. Yeah, I was going to say I bet everyone took advantage of that one. I think we can probably kick off with the session, and then people can join as we go along. Sure. So uh, the agenda today is uh, going to talk about uh, the Agile approach, uh, DevOps and SRE at Vodafone. Uh, how and what kind of technologies are you using? How are we uh, uh, selecting and choosing those technologies? Uh, and how is life in general Vodafone? Um, is there anything done there which you would like to kick start with? No, uh, I think if we go along as we, as we go, I'll probably ask a lot of questions. Absolutely. So. Uh, I wanted to start with Agile uh, because that, that is many of the discussion which uh, um, uh, we always been asked, are you guys using Agile? What is Agile? Why are you using Agile? How does it come to SRE? Um, so it's probably a nice start. Uh, there are many different definitions out there uh, to describe uh, what is Agile, how to implement Agile in the first place. In the best one which I uh, like is what you have uh, in the middle of the screen, which is basically a uh, suggested uh, set of best practices, uh, which is thrives with collaboration of many self-organizing and cross-functioning cross teams. So the idea there is frequent review, collaboration, with cross-functioning teams to have an end-to-end -end overview, have the people who owning uh, and understanding the full end-to-end -end cycle of the code to work and collaborate together because, uh, to share the same goal. And this is really similar to DevOps in the first place. So as we describe Agile, so why? Why are we even talking about that? Why, why, why uh, we start with this? So on the previous discussion, uh, which you had uh, with Ben Conley, uh, there was um, the discussion around Vodafone Telco to Tech. Vodafone has its really open goal to become from the traditional telecommunication company to a technology company. Uh, and that's, that's why we're here. That's why are we talking about it. This is how Agile comes in the first place. So if we are talking about telco to telco, how are we planning to do it? So one of the first thing which we started to talk about is DevOps. Uh, DevOps is basically a set of practices uh, and uh, those practices are uh, focused around building and running systems with automation focus on customer experience. Therefore, uh, everything uh, which we do should improve resiliency. And if the resiliency is improved, the customer experience is likely to be improved. Every, every system, doesn't matter how great your application is, if it's not resilient enough, if the customers cannot enjoy that service all the time when they need it on demand, then that application will might going to be a miss. 
So that DevOps, but how and why DevOps is actually comes to the picture. Uh, so DevOps is a set of best practices, right? Uh, and Google defined those uh, best practices 10 plus years ago, if not 15, I don't remember the exact time. Uh, and DevOps uh, and Google also defined a set of engineering group and named them Site Reality Engineering and defined Site Reality Engineering as the engineering group who are live and die by the DevOps principles. They are the one implementing these DevOps best practices. And this is how we come back, Vodafone's systems engineering. Mm -hmm. Systems engineering is a wide uh, set of groups uh, who are self-organized on various systems uh, and functioning through these DevOps best practices. Uh, and all are site rabbit engineers. Perfect. Um, so I, I guess two questions on on that piece. Me, myself, and you had a uh, a conversation earlier this week on on DevOps. Is it a uh, is it a principle or is it a, a actual job title? And I know this is something you're actually quite passionate about. So I'd love you to speak a little bit more about that. Thank you very much for the question. So. Um, Yes, so I have my strong personal opinion about this, uh, which is probably going to divide people, but DevOps engineer should not be a job title, in my own opinion. It's like we don't call people agile engineer uh, in the first place. Uh, DevOps is a set of best practices. It is a guideline how to build uh, automated self-serve systems, how to get code quicker from the dev side to the production. That is how to build a resilient system. This is all covered by uh, DevOps best practices. Yep. However, as I said, uh, even Google defines it uh, as the set, of, uh, the group of engineers using, defining these best practices uh, and implementing those are the site relevant engine. So, when I see a job title stating DevOps engineer, I understand what they mean by that. I understand how it has happened. However, if you ask me, that should be uh, Site Rabbit Engineering as a title, and that's what we are doing at Nice. Uh, and then I guess on on Agile, Agile is a um, is a term that every company will say that they work in an Agile environment. Um, yeah. Whereas if I'm if I'm honest, when I talk to a lot of clients, the, you, you sometimes question, okay, are you using that as as um, as mouth service because everyone is talking about Agile? So where, I guess, to, taking it from a Vodafone perspective, but also your knowledge of the outside market, where do you think the market is right now on that movement towards uh, an Agile way? It is really depends on which, which uh, uh, company are we talking about, which market, which side of the, the scope uh, are we uh, trying to target here. Um, in short, Agile and DevOps are a complex uh, but clean set of best practices and principles. Agile uh, software development principles would uh, ask you to be collaborative, run, things through um, sprints as short as possible, constantly talk uh, and redefine your roadmaps, constantly reevaluate your goals, your tooling. Uh, and it's really closely comes with the DevOps back practices and there are many things which are overlapping each other. Some companies are implementing more out of these best, uh, both those principles than others. Uh, many, many, many companies, based on my experience, uh, say that they use uh, Agile and they use DevOps uh, because they took X percentage of these principles and implemented it in different level of maturity. It is it really depends on where are they in this implementation journey, how mature the culture at the moment in this company, uh, and it is really, really uh, a wide range based on my experience. We at Vodafone are in, in a good middle uh, of our journey to do the transformation and uh, try to transform the business to be fully fueled by these principles and start enjoying the benefits which it brings. But it's, it's hard work and it's a, it's a long journey. Some companies did it much earlier. Some companies are just starting right now. 
Um, first question we've had in the uh, in the chat is, what's the difference between a DevOps engineer and DevOps developer? Are they the same thing? DevOps is development and uh, operations combined together. The whole idea is to remove the barriers uh, in between the two groups. Uh, Google made a really nice two, three minutes video back in the day explaining uh, how, how was it in a traditional setup where development team completed the code, hand it over, it's not my problem anymore, and you go home. Uh, operations take the code, I don't know why is it, but I have so many problems, but devs were focused on providing features and features and features, operations were focused on resiliency, uh, manageability. Now, these two had a lot of uh, clashes and challenges. By taking DevOps together, uh, it brings them closer. They share the responsibility to code, and the, the mm, responsibility to manage and run those codes are shared and owned by the same team, DevOps team. DevOps developer, in my opinion, uh, is focused on uh, how, uh, is a developer who is lived by the DevOps principles and the DevOps engineer could be either, but I believe in this context might be the one who is focused more on operation and resilience side, therefore it's an SRE engineer. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, I hope I answered it. I think, I think you answered that as well as I, I think that's what I was thinking would be the answer to. So that's great. I think if we move on to the next section, you've actually inspired some really good questions. So later on, we're gonna have to go through some of them. There's some really good ones coming in. I just see that for some reason, our um, uh, presentation have some of the letters jumped up and down. So apologize for that. Uh, the structure is not the nicest. Not sure what happened. So um, the what's the DevOps model, right? So if I want to super simplify it, everything is automated, everything is monitored, and all the releases uh, are shared. And it is super important to highlight the idea is to improve the speed of delivery from a development local machine to production. The dream is to deploy directly to production without any human interaction whatsoever. Netflix, for example, is doing it uh, today. They are a great example of how to get that done. But this is super complex, especially if you are not starting from scratch. So the idea here is to, to emphasize uh, with the DevOps model that what you are gaining is you build a system which is quicker and easier to maintain, uh, helps you achieve your goal, which is uh, fast speed to production, but also improves your visibility, ob uh, observability, quality of code through many automated testing. This is where CI, CD pipeline comes to the picture. Mm -hmm. Unit test, functional testing, end-to-end um, uh, -end, uh, reviews, uh, smoke tests, all of them combined into one continuous automated pipeline to go through multiple steps of quality gates in order to uh, take your code into production uh, and ensure that every step, every single time is well taken. Nice. Uh, and I guess uh, CD is where every, everyone wants to get towards continuous uh, deployment. And like you said, Netflix are an example of a company that are truly working in a, a CD environment and there's people like um, Instagram are doing it and Pinterest are doing it as well. What do you think, um, where do you think that the majority of companies are at the moment in that uh, journey and what are some of the pitfalls that you think that companies need to think about um, and try avoiding? Okay, so it's a really interesting question because it's, it's really complex. Uh, CD is continuous deployment. Uh, some people say continuous development. It's, I, I, I want to talk about the continuous deployment sure. cycle of this. The, the whole goal of the CI CD is to get the code as quick to production as possible and true CD, in my definition, if you reach it to production without any interaction, without any human approval or anything like that. This is what I would define as continuous deployment. This is how the industry sets as the desired end goal. Now, many companies uh, are, it depends on the maturity level, breaks somewhere uh, reaching uh, mid or high-end environments 
for example, staging environments or pre-prod environments or pre-live environments, but stop there and do a manual or separate pipeline to release the prod. The end goal, which we should keep always in front of us is you don't need that quality gate once your pipeline and your testing capability, observable, observable capability is mature enough. The end goal is to get constantly there. There are very little amount of company I personally know of who are capable of releasing the production straight away without uh, any uh, intermediate step. And sure. once you break it, it's not a continuous deployment. Sure. Um, do you want to do you want to move on to the next section, or do you want a couple of questions? Completely. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm I'm happy to cover questions if you like, or happy to move on. So let, let's let's do two questions, then we can move on to the next part. Um, at Vodafone, how are how is DevOps tied into systems design and architecture? So systems engineering is working closely uh, hand by hand with architecture. Architecture is something which everybody needs to consider when you build any complex systems. And we are talking about a really complex environment. Uh, there are multiple arms and legs of uh, architecture from solution architects, which can be software architecture, infrastructure architect, uh, performance architect, pure cloud infrastructure architect. All of these are different areas, requires different expertise. Um, what we do is we work really closely with uh, all of the delivery teams, all of the architecture teams, security teams, and combine them together to the end solution. We propose designs, get reviews by each other, and once those uh, relevant teams are reviewed, those implementations, only then changes goes into production, at least an ideal world, this is how the end goal should look like. Uh, we're trying to be as transparent with every single team all around us as possible, but keep in mind our clear goals, which is resiliency, customer experience, availability, and quality. Those things we are not ready to compromise on. Everything else works as nice, big, happy family. Nice. Um, and then uh, I guess the, the next question is that, AI, I think people think that AI is a new thing, but in reality, AI is something that's been around for decades, but it's just that now we're really starting to implement it into day-to-day -day life, i.e. why people think about it a lot more. How has AI influenced uh, how uh, DevOps and uh, site reliability um, works? How AI influenced how site reliability works? I not sure I will be able to answer that in that level, but I will try to answer it, how it's influenced <laughs> what we are doing right now. Um, AI is a really wise thing, and it, I can't define it in a single way. So if we are talking about something which is machine learning and forecasting, I would like to try to drive it into the forecasting area, because this is the easiest example I can sure. think of. Uh, I think that's a good idea. We, we are using... Uh, some technologies uh, which understands patterns uh, of what's happening in the, uh, through different core KPIs. How many customers I see at nine o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock or 8 p.m. And if that system is receive, have the data for the last six months, we'll understand what the curve should look like mm -hmm. uh, on a normal day, one, uh, weekday, weekend day, on a day when I run a com campaign, there is uh, some kind of notification comes out. How is it normally looks like based on a, uh, a loads of data which I give that system without me telling them what to do. And therefore, it understands the trend. And using trend analysis will tell me, hey, today you have 100,000 customer minutes checking your website, which is 50% more than what you had on any other Monday or the other way around. You only have 10,000 customers checking your websites in a minute, but usually you have 100,000. So there is some kind of uh, misalignment compared to what I expect to see. Therefore, we get notification and we can use it. But more, more interestingly, auto scaling, for example, with this trend analysis, if you expect because, uh, a higher amount of requests coming to your stack before it reaches, so if you are capable of taking data from your first load balancer to what endpoint that's going to hit, 
you are gaining a couple of seconds before you actually start experiencing it. Normally, AWS or, or the traditional uh, auto scaling technologies would kick in once you reach your pike on consumption. You reach the threshold, I want to, I, I, I reach 60%, I need to scale. Yep. But you could leverage that technology, and we are doing it right now, where information coming in from the load balancer, I am sending requests to your way. I am not waiting for that 60% to happen. Yep. I decide to auto scale earlier, and I might do it on the cost of my own unnecessarily, but it's better to be prepared earlier and then avoid any real uptake on performance side, which then could cause uh, challenges on scale. And this is how it is influenced. We, we, in, in really short, if we take these informations and use it cleverly, we can improve our speed of reaction by, and, and speed of understanding of what's going on uh, than in a traditional old fashioned way. Sure. So you're, you're trying to be, it's, it's allowing you to be more proactive rather than reactive. Yes. In, in some ways. Much nicer. Thing. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Cool. I, I think we, uh, if we move on to the next section, so I know we've got a lot to go through, but there's some really good questions that we'll go back to later. All right. So again, slides are really misaligned. I'm sorry. I'm honestly don't know. I don't know what's happened. Um, not sure. Uh, anyway, uh, half an hour ago it was fun. Mm -hmm. So our goal, right? So is these technical initiatives, fast time to production, world class testing capability, strong resiliency patterns and clear observability. This is everything which we told so far. And we all doing these things to bring a much better, uh, much uh, more pleasant customer experience to our customers. This everything is around customer experience, which we're trying to do. And, and it's not just in our end. Site reliability engineering is always going to focus on the customer of the systems which they are building with through resiliency and availability. So what technology are we choosing? Uh, our mantra is to use the right tool for the right job. So there is very little amount of time when we dictate the tool. This is the tool when you have, which you have to use. There are, of course, cases to do that. There are the right reasons to say, I need that tool, it was implemented, it provides you a much wider end-to-end -end view, single pane of glass uh, of what you are doing. So from a bigger picture point of view, those demanding requests are perfectly valid and make sense. But from an engineering point of view, what we're trying to do is an engineering driven culture. Uh, we try to tell our engineers what we would like to get as an end goal. And we are looking for solutions. What do you need if you are an engineer at Vodafone? This is where I want to get to. What do you need to get there? What tool do you want to, to use uh, in order to get there? What you build is going to stick with you so the decision is at your end. We're constantly trying to reevaluate the tools which we are using. Are they still the best tool for the job? And many times uh, the world is changing around you. New tools coming in. There is lots of new evaluation happening. But when somebody says, oh, here is a tool. It is slightly better than what we're using now. Let's switch. We also need to consider is the switch, is the um, investment you would put into changing, does it actually give you the value in the long term? which you want to get. SRE by nature should always focus on make tomorrow better. Anything which you do today, uh, manually, semi-manually, but all your PE work, can I automate this further so I can focus on the more engineering challenges so I can make tomorrow better? And that comes to the tool section as well. If it's meaningful to change, we should change and we should try to make tomorrow better on the right cost. If the, uh, the investment uh, brings the uh, while you're sure, and I, I building on something from a previous conversation we've had, and I loved when you you said it. What you essentially said to me the other day was, you shouldn't be looking so much at the time spent to uh, implement the tool or time spent to learn the tool. It's what do you gain back in the future. So if it takes you two weeks to to implement a new tool that's going to give you uh, two months uh, worth of, of run rate in the future, like it's worth doing it because ultimately that that is more important it's not the upfront it's the the end result exactly so uh, google defines it uh, as toil uh, which is time to spend on things which you do on a daily basis manually or semi manually so if you have to do a report which takes you half an hour every week 
uh, and you know that you need to do this for the whole year, then you know that you need to do this 52 times half an hour. Uh, and that's the 26 hours which you're going to spend on. If you can spend two working days uh, to automate that things away, so you spend two weeks, 16 hours, yeah. then in the future going to gain back uh, the 26, that investment is well spent. You don't have to worry about it and you can constantly evolve it. Evolving it is going to be simpler by using through an automated method. And this is just the simplest example. If, if you do a patching, uh, patching really log in, do the change, trying to do it. It is a really constant operational overhead you have to do. If you spend a couple of months implementing an immutable infrastructure, implementing things where you literally just can sort of switch things over, that would save you such a significant amount of time ahead and you basically automate your manual task away so that in the future you can focus on bringing new and new things in. That's SRE is about. Nice. Um, and then there's a, there's a question in the, in the chat about uh, your opinion on whether when you are looking at, um, at would you look at a vendor approach to tools you use or would you go for like a best of breed i would you use everything in the uh in the amazon ecosystem or would you go with okay this is the tool that we should use it doesn't matter that we're we use amazon from our cloud we want to use a different tool it is a tricky question and there is no simple answer there is no right answer use the right tool for the job that's that's i cannot say to that because if you know if you are in a, in a hypothetical situation where you're you don't mind which cloud provider you use uh and you, you don't need to have multi-cloud environment and you know that there are solutions which you don't want to spend time and energy on to be open source go for the ones which you find the best use something which is there don't reinvent the wheel there is no reason to to over complicate things although we engineers love to over complicate <laughs> uh, however if the bigger picture point of view you want to have the capability you need to have the capability to be able to switch between uh, providers not necessarily because you use both because you want to be able to say if something happens tomorrow on provider x i need to be able to go to provider epsilon then try to decouple yourself from it because as deep as you go into something which is out of the box as hard as going to be for you to break it away it is really a trade-off of how much you get vendor logged in to a solution compared how much energy you want to spend to maintain your own solution sure. most of the times doesn't make sense to do your own solution to be honest unless you are in a unique situation when this is one of your primary goal which case it makes sense makes sense perfect i think we can move on to the next section so that doesn't look that bad but that's also changed so basically uh there is two world right uh operations and development developers and this is where we bring it into devops and this is what you bring into sre so what i'm trying to say on that slide is you have a goal from a development point of view i need to build in my example cloud native applications i am purely focused on getting everything around APIs, everything should be microservice. I need a really nice framework. I need the good languages. I need to have uh, stateless things in one side. I need to make sure that I treat stateless, stateful sets on the other way. And, and all of these things I need to consider. I have my own goals, my checks, that's fine. On the other hand, DevOps best practices tells you how to automate and test and move that code into the environment and into the system. So you take all of these uh, nice approaches of continuous integration, continuous delivery, chaos testing, feature flag, immutable infrastructure, version control, all of these basic uh, industry standard uh, uh, approaches, and you start try to combine them. The important thing is to see the, the big picture at first. You need to have these requirements you have from the application side. You need to have the requirements coming from the uh, SRE side. You need to make sure that they are complementing each other. And we, uh, at least from a selfish systems point of view, as I'm more closer to the system side, uh, the requirements uh, are, can be break down into simplish groups. 
every system must be easily reproducible. The idea here is not to do it manually, do it through a pipeline. <clears throat> Sorry. And from our end, uh, we define things needs to be immutable. You need to be able to throw it away, bring in something new. You don't want to go in and constantly change things. You want to be able to have infrastructure where you build, bring something in, throw it away, because we would love, we want to get to a canary deployment setup. Uh, we want to make sure that everything is disposable exactly because of that reason. Every system must be consistent. And that's just not, uh, not just because of us, availability point of view, customer point of view, data uh, point of view. Every process must be repeatable. Why would you do new processes for all the time if you can bring it into as small building blocks as you can to then reuse them as less management and development overhead you have in the future? Everything must be version controlled. I don't think we need to even talk about this is such a standard right now. And by doing that, you will end up uh, having a tooling requirement, which are declarative. Declarative for orchestration-wise or resource definition-wise. Terraform, Ansible, Pet Chef, Puppet. That's what we're talking about. If you want a true declarative one, you're likely going to talk about Terraform. Uh, you want item potency. Uh, if I run something 10 times, I still want the exact same end result at the end. Item potency is super important and many people sometimes oversteps it. It means that I define by using declarative orchestration that my end goal is to have five instances of X being live. If I say that to the system 10 times in a row, the end result always should be that five at the end. If it's not, that's item potency. If it's not item potent, you say, I need five instances, I need five instances, I need five instances, you will end up three times five instances because that's what you get in a traditional way. If it's item potent, you just defined my end goal is to have five instances, doesn't matter how many times you ask, that's what you're going to have. And this is the key to have self-healing uh, as a very first step, because if you say, this is my healthy state to have five instances, you did one died, uh, if it's, uh, well-defined, it will say, but my end goal is to have five. Let me just do whatever is needed to bring it back. But in order to achieve that, secret and environment information shouldn't be in code, shouldn't be hard-coded. It shouldn't be something which a uh, developer or an engineer tells what it is. It should be self-discovering. So, for example, if you use tagging, and this is the next point in a, a cloud provider, the tags can help the system define and discover What's my surrounding? How many instances of this do I have at the moment? Because things are always changing. You don't want a rigid config. You want, hey, I'm scaling in the middle right now, but this is the healthy state. I am at the moment in an unhealthy state, so I need to react to this. And reality is that, you know, ideal world, you shouldn't be have any kind of auto automation on the top of your orchestration, but you always will have. Uh, you will always have the need to do that. So therefore, if you add things into your automation and you put your custom scripts that must be containerized. If you want to go through on the CI CD pipeline, environment, environment, retest and retest on different phases and different uh, uh, surroundings, everything should be, must be easily shippable, hence containerizable. Amazing. I think, I think uh, the next section, if I'm not wrong, moves us on to Vodafone. Oh, no, we've got oh. one more to go still. Almost. <laughs> so Bring me off. everything which I just said, just, just, it's even missing characters here now. Some reason Zoom doesn't like this presentation. Uh, I don't know how this happened. But basically, you build it, you ship it, you love it. And this is, this is our mantra, which I'm trying to constantly, constantly emphasize every single time. The whole idea of having this approach, this theme, uh, is to share the goal and share the responsibility. And that means that if you build something, you build it for yourself and you will have to stick with it. It will be, you will be the one who is responsible to maintain, to keep it alive, to fix if it breaks. So if you do a good job, you do, you do a, a good uh, deed for yourself. If you do a bad job about this, you will have a lot of uh, work in the future to fix what you should have fixed, uh, build better in the first place. And yes, the next section is live at Vodafone. And I keep seeing the, uh, the book in your background, uh, your Vodafone book. So uh, you, you branded yourself up for this. I love it. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't want to sound like a salesperson, but it is an amazing community 
uh, uh, to be at Vodafone. Uh, this is a beautiful picture which I received on a nice sunny day, not a single drop of rain uh, in uh, uh, our new London headquarter. Um, but we have an amazing campus, as you mentioned as well, at Newbury. The, the offices are open, are there to encourage collaboration, to speak with each other, uh, and it's, 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 just, it's just a really nice place to be. You feel really good uh, around these people. I really like uh, our colleagues. Um, Vodafone is clearly uh, trying to demonstrate the very best of how much effort do they give to each individual uh, which we are working with. Uh, there is a lot of um, initiatives, hundreds and hundreds, which are happening uh, constantly at Vodafone to improve uh, people's lives, promote healthy life work balance, to regardless of people's uh, circumstances, helps them evolve to be a better engineer, a better person, a better trainer, a better leader, a better colleague. All of these things are with an amazing amount, it's, it's probably too much overwhelming at the moment, amount of information, amount of uh, help you get for it. So it is really, truly a really nice place, which is enables you to, to be you, be yourself, and uh, experience the, the work which you do at its best. It, you don't have to, to um, try to align with many people. We have so many different people so, from so many different countries. We work on different time zones. We work with different mentality. We work on different locations. The current pandemic just proved it very well that regardless of where you are, regardless of uh, how you look like, how you behave, how you uh, speak, uh, how you, um, sorry for that, um, interact with others outside of your work, uh, you are going to be able to do your work uh, if you want to. And this is what it enables, what often enables people to do. If, if they want to do their work, uh, they can. Love it. And I know um, when we spoke the other day, you were, I mentioned that I come from a, um, a learned disabilities background myself. Um, and I asked you, I actually asked you quite a candid question of how would a Vodafone get around this uh, with someone like dyslexia, for example? How do you get around that in your interview process? And your answer, and I'll let you go into deeper detail, but your answer was that regardless of someone's background or disabilities or anything like that, everyone has strengths, uh, strengths and weaknesses. And it's more about how can you promote their strengths and help them with their weaknesses. So I love that that's a mantra that you and Vodafone promote. Absolutely. And just, just to add to that, we hire people for the job. Just like we say with tooling, use the right job for the right, uh, for the right tool for the job. Use the right people for the job. So I'm more... Uh, we, we look into not uh, any other uh, properties of the person, but how well they can perform their task. If they can perform their task well, every other attribute is secondary. Uh, if they are amazing on every other attribute, but you, you can't perform their job on the level, which I'm expecting that they are not necessarily the right candidate. And this is the key, right? Find the right people for the right job. If they can't do it, then we can help with all the other attributes. We can, we can upskill, even with experience, it's for, for us at the moment, and for me personally, it's less about how many years can you prove to me or how much hands-on experience you have right now compared to what is your potential so that you will be able to do the work which I'm asking from you in six or 12 months. This work is, the, our work in general, SRE, is changing with such a fast pace then what we need is not a person who can do the job today. We need the person who can job, do the job of tomorrow. We need to figure it out what's there. We need people who can lead themselves, understand the big picture, do their own research, and propose solutions. I see the problem coming. This is my opinion how to fix it, and let's go and get it done together. And this is the last point on, on, on this, is getting the, get it done together. Because if you can be the best engineer, if you cannot work in a big team, then 
you probably have to find a really specialized area where you can work alone. But this is more or less most of the times the teamwork. Right. So yeah, uh, in terms of what Vodafone is all about and what how, how does it comes to the picture. Uh, one of the best things about Vodafone, I think, is, is a really, really clear reason of why are we doing what we are doing. And the mantra is super simple. We want to build a better future. We want to connect for a better future. We want to help people to, to, to enjoy their life better. 5G, the 5G internet, the amount of connectivity and energy we're putting into customer engagement and into the network and into the websites uh, are all around to improve the future uh, customer's life of Vodafone. And we are doing it by uh, having these discussions, by building these systems which we are talking about, by uh, constantly emphasizing and showing what the Vodafone spirit is all about. And Vodafone spirit is something which whoever uh, and whenever they join uh, to Vodafone will be immediately familiar with because it's all about customer, customer loyalty, uh, and therefore from systems wise, availability, resiliency, constant nice experience. Create future together, uh, understand the why, understand where we are going, Think big. There is a lots of things which we are trying, experimenting with, which is game changing. And some of them are failing. But if they fail, we, 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 we experiment with it. We fail fast, we try again and we try again. Failure is a natural uh, thing that occurs all the time. If you stop when you fail, then, then, then this is a real failure. If you just failed, you step up and you do it again and again until you don't actually give up, it's not, 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 the, uh, not a real failure, it's just a learning opportunity. And as I said, we get it done together. It is a massive uh, family and a massive amount of amazing engineers who we're working with, with completely different backgrounds, with lots of different knowledge and expertise from all the areas. There is an overwhelming amount of uh, sharing and communication happening at Vodafone, which is, really challenging to take in but it's super amazing in the same time yeah and you uh and i don't know if you know the, the famous quote there's a nelson mandela quote that talks about it's not how many times you fall it's how many times you rise afterwards so it's uh it's a really good uh mantra that I, and i agree that it's it's all about learning from mistakes because ultimately how can you learn if you don't have mistakes there in the first place Absolutely. I already see the next slide is going to be broken big time. So I apologize for that. What happened here is I asked my colleagues to come up with words on uh, how life at Vodafone is. But this representation here is very unpleasant. So I apologize for that. Uh, but the idea which I wanted to show is there is a lot of different opinion uh, some of them are more positive than others. Uh, some of them are uh, less positive, but uh, the message which I'm trying to, to go through with here, and again, apologize for the broken side, is something which everybody should experience themselves. It, the, the experience of that kind of culture, it means different people, different things, because as we discussed multiple times, we are all different, all, all have a different reaction for things. But for me, this is one of the most important things when I choose where I want to work with, uh, where I want to work. If I see that what I'm doing is meaningful, if I see that uh, I like to be there, I, I'm some, probably spending just as much time at work than I do anything else. Uh, and therefore it's super important, how do you feel? And that's, that is one of the key messages I wanted to give out is if you have an experience, if you have a chance to experience it, it's an amazing feeling. Nice. That's yours, then. So uh, I, I guess I'll throw some questions to you uh, during this, but um, just for everyone that is on this call, just want to re-emphasize that Vodafone are still ha uh, heavily hiring. I have a conversation with their recruit manager all the time, and um, compared to a lot of businesses in the market at the moment, you seem to be taking utter advantage of. Look, there, there are there's so much great talent out there in the market at the moment. Um, so you're doing a lot of virtual hiring. 
I guess question for you, um, and it actually came from the chat, so it's interesting that we got to this slide very quickly afterwards, is how has the current situation affected um, like hiring and, and with the virtual hiring tips and, and what you guys are doing, how has that affected your process? Okay, that is less of a tricky one because I am super happy to say that that actually went surprisingly well because we, we changed what we've done. Our pro, uh, process was a uh, multiple phase interview where the end was a face-to-face -face interview. And what we've done is literally moved everything into virtual meeting. We started to use Zoom, Slack, Skype, Google Hangouts, any mean of uh, online video calls. And what we've done is we did the exact same process. We gave questions, we had a nice chat, we gave a uh, challenging uh, short assignment, which we wanted to see the result of. Online tools these days sometimes works even better than if you get a whiteboard. Of course, it's not going to ever replace face-to-face -face direct interaction, but it went much smoother than I originally expected. I am super proud to say that in the last two months, we've onboarded eight SRE engineers just to my team. And I know that the amount of people we managed to hire during this hard time is a really uh, impressive uh, amount on even an enormous uh, situation. Yeah, I, I, I was chatting to, um, uh, I'll throw Lucy's name into the, into the conversation. I was chatting to Lucy yesterday and we were talking about how you guys have continued hiring. I think it's phenomenal what you guys have done because it's all, I think, it's all well and good having a good uh, recruitment process during this, but ultimately it's all about the onboarding process. And some of the stuff that you guys are doing is allowing candidates to uh, feel like they're a part of the company very early on, um, which is a very hard thing to do. I, I think that if you'd said to most of the world back in January that we were gonna go fully remote for a couple of months and that people are going to be onboarded without ever going to visit the office or seeing colleagues and we're going to feel part of the team. I don't think that that probably would have happened, but, um, but now looking at it back, I think Vodafone are a perfect example of a company that have, have seen the challenge and kind of rose to it. I, I, I cannot agree more. Uh, what I was really surprising for me is the logistics handling. Uh, most of our candidates, I cannot say all, but almost all candidates received their hardware equipment. And, and if, if, they, if they joined, they could ask for uh, home office equipment, which is still happening. It's like, this is everything you need to start working for us and tell us if you need more. And you had everything before your day one or on your day one. And by day two, they were able to log in. They could be able to have the the... Uh, video discussions and everything happened remotely. I have colleagues we hired and I never met in person yet, which is strange. Crazy. And um, question that's just jumped into the into the chat. With uh, you working remotely at the moment and most of your team working remotely, where do you think that the uh, the team will be in six months' time? Do you think that their Vodafone as a company will probably be more open to remote working, or how do you I see the future going? Yeah, so I believe, you know, I personally, a type of person who likes to be in the office, I like to be able to just turn around, ask somebody a question instead of type or, or try to get the attention. Uh, but it depends people on people. So I personally hope I can go back to the office soon, uh, but only if it's safe. The uh, future of this, I believe, Vodafone realized with many other companies that how much easier is to let people work from home than they thought and how less impact or maybe even a positive uptake of people working from home have uh, instead of they coming into the office. So I strongly believe that uh, it is going to be further empowered uh, to work from home, have more flexibility and more control on the employee and the engineer side of where they want to work. But it's obviously going to depend on areas and teams and, and job uh, which they do, but from our end, I feel more and more closer to the original statement which uh, uh, we made that it doesn't matter where you are in the globe, what time zone, what part of the world, if you have a good internet, you have the capability and the will to work, you will be able to work. 
So I believe Vodafone will encourage the, the uh, engineers to decide and have more flexibility. But I also believe that uh, sometimes to be in the same place, have face-to-face -face discussions, have the, the uh, office environment available for you, not just because you want to, because sometimes it's just easier to work from an office. You can, not, not, many, many, many of our colleagues face the challenge that are just not equipped to work from home on the same level and quality than how they are in the office. So I believe it's just flexibility which is going to be improved. Yeah, I, and I am very much with you that the minute that it's safe uh, for me to go back to the office, I can't wait to get back to the office because I'm very much a, uh, I love being around people. Um, and my partner works for the police, so I spend most of my days very lonely. Um, so I can't wait for it. But um, so it's really refreshing to get it from, uh, to hear from a kind of head of, and you said something the other day about how, um, the challenge with working from home uh, and managing a team is that people feel the need to, well, I've got, oh, I've walked past my computer, I can do this. Like it's very hard for you to step away from work. Yeah, this is, this is the pitfall of this, right? So it's um, for an employer, it's great. People probably even going to work more. Yeah. But for me, it's re as an employee, it is really hard to get LC work-life balance when your work is physically in the same location where yeah. you live because i know i need to do this more i know i just, just just one more many people can have this mental or uh, um, separation i just left work yeah. i will open this one up next morning when i come in but when it's in front of you and it's open and it's flashing and it's nobody nobody's enforcing you to do it right but the the will power is needed to be able to say, I'm down for the day. And I see on many colleagues of, of mine, many uh, engineers who I work with is, they just want to be nice, they want to help. I can do this quickly. And ended up doing over hours. So I'm constantly trying to encourage everybody that don't, don't overdo it. Do what you feel it was for the day, but don't do more. Uh, otherwise, in the long run, you will going to burn out. We're doing this since the last four months now. And I'm not sure when we're going to have a clear cut at its end. So we just need to make sure that we're saving enough energy for ourselves mentally and physically to be able to do this longer if it's needed. Great. Uh, and I, I guess we've got five minutes left, so two final questions. Um, one of them is really is focusing more on that kind of junior level. So um, what would be your advice? What advice would you give to someone that's recently finished a coding boot camp and that step into employment? I'm not sure. Depends what's, what, what, what would you, uh, as a freshly uh, uh, graduated person, you want to do with, uh, with your future career? Where do you want to go? I believe, set for, uh, I, all I can say is set yourself a challenge which you believe is going to be a stretch mm. and go for it. Because don't, don't set something which you believe you will be able to achieve. Set something which is not impossible, but I just highly doubt I can do it and then try to do it. And once you did it, do it once again and do it once again. Um, the market right now is very crazy. The demand is changing. Uh, some, some companies are hiring so many people. Some companies slow down their hiring. Uh, I, you, in your position as a, uh, as a freshly graduated person, if you know where you want to go, Look around, set a challenge which uh, is really a challenge for you, and then just just go for it. Nice. And, and final question: um, When we went through it the other day, I was fascinated by the the makeup of your own team. So, can you just quickly walk us through the team you've got? Because they all sit within uh, systems engineering, but there's many skill sets within it. So, if you could do that, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, we are, so SRE, as we discussed many times, is, is a really wide and complex uh, um, area where we're trying to cover lots of ground. Um, but we, uh, in Vodafone Systems Engineering, are trying to cover the basics of platform and infrastructure. How do you build? How do you uh, implement? How do you design automation and the actual infrastructure? And how do you actually maintain it? Then there is a part of observability, which is a separate thing, which is uh, focusing on resiliency. How do you, what, what's your availability? What are the key KPIs? How do I alert? How do I know if something's good or bad? 
taking the machine learning? How do you know if what was the trend I should follow? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? All the automation around it. If I want to deploy something brand new, I don't want to manually create all of these dashboards. I want all the KPIs automatically appear to me, set up my alerting. I really don't want to spend hours on this. So we build automation for that. We have a separate operational arm who is not in systems engineering, but we are working very closely with them and they are the soul of, of how everything is working today. We have uh, areas where we focus on security uh, and uh, ensure that the code is tested. We have areas which is focus on performance testing, focus on chaos testing, and want to make sure that even if I want to break it, I can't break it. And this is probably one of the most exciting engineering challenges. Yeah, really. Everybody builds with their best knowledge something which shouldn't be breakable. I want to break it. I want to prove I can. And this back and forth is amazing. And we are going to focus on in the future, hopefully, uh, more automation, uh, more around data, more around uh, circuit breakers, but this is, this is uh, ahead. Nice, perfect. Um, so I think we've got to the end of our session, unfortunately. There's uh, loads more questions I'd love to ask you, but uh, I think uh, it's going to be a struggle to get much past that. So thanks so much for your time today. I hope that everyone on the, on the sessions really enjoyed it. Um, if you've got further questions afterwards, um, if you want to reach out to hello at hackerjob.co, I will uh, then reach out to David and we'll, we'll find a way to promote these uh, online. Go for questions then. Thank you very much, guys. Perfect. Cheers, Thanks. guys. Take care.